regional consequences for the security of Southeast Asia. Arguably, these two issues are endemic to the nature of Pakistan, a state in which it seems almost impossible, at present at least, for democracy to take root and to thrive. This week, the 70th anniversary of Pakistan's birth has clearly erected another milestone to measure its progress as a modern state. Although the Democracy Forum is planning officially to mark the anniversary of independence at a special event on the 29th of September, please mark your diaries, it's arguable that the subjects under discussion today are entirely inseparable from any responsible act of commemoration. That Pakistan has endured such a fragile experience of democracy since 1947, while suffering from the insidious influence of an hegemonic state, is a matter of great concern to all of us who care about the future of the subcontinent. I think it's fair to conclude that even when the last eyewitness statement to the horror of partition is recorded and transcribed, we will still never really comprehend the enormity of what happened in 1947. It will continue to cast a shadow over our lives and maybe the lives of our children far into the future. Indeed, it seems that Pakistan's tragedy is to be burdened by its own nemesis as a direct consequence of partition. A nation conceived essentially as a negotiating stratagem to reassure the scattered Muslim minority of its security and survival in the post-colonial subcontinent. Indeed, the idea of it moved millions of Muslims into expecting a separate country, but their leaders had made no preparations for running a separate state. Pakistan is a state founded on a religious principle. Indeed, it is the only country created in the name of Islam anywhere in the world, and born, moreover, out of intolerance. I've heard it described as an unstable theocracy constructed from an artificial religious unity. But it's worth remembering that the very basis of Pakistan's stability as a state was widely debated at the time of its conception. Maulana Azhar, one of the few politicians of partition who emerged with his integrity intact, predicted its demise as early as 1946, reminding his audience that an entity conceived in hatred will last only as long as that <coughs> hatred lasts. And chillingly, he added, this hatred will overwhelm relations between India and Pakistan. It's uncanny how accurate the Malala's prescience seems today. For we forget that Muhammad Ali Jinnah, founder of Pakistan, expressed his hopes that Pakistan would become Muslim, though a pluralist state. And on the, uh, so, sorry, a secular Muslim, though a pluralist state. And on the day of its birth, on the 11th of August 1947, he addressed the Constituent Assembly with this intention, stating clearly, we are starting with the fundamental principle that we are all citizens and equal citizens of one state. But within two years, Jinnah's blueprint for a... And during the debates that followed the resolution, the Prime Minister, Lakat Ali Khan, was criticised for concealing the true purpose of the Constitution, to suppress minorities and hobble the opposition. Perhaps the most unintended of Jinnah's consequences follows a speech which he gave in Cairo in December 1946, when he told a skeptical Arab audience that it is only when Pakistan is established that Indian and Egyptian Muslims will be really free. What Jinnah had not anticipated, however, was the role that such an expectation would place on Pakistan to act as a geopolitical pivot, balancing the diverse interests of its neighbours. And indeed, the developments during the first two years of Pakistan's existence foreshadowed the path the country would take in subsequent decades. As Hussein Haqqani reminds us, 
Pakistan actively sought to become a Western ally on the one hand, but embraced anti-Western vocabulary on the other. It is this fundamental dichotomy which lies at the base of Pakistan's statehood and which our panelists will be discussing today. Indeed, it is the very nature of its political instability which justifies the dominance of its military interests and consequently stifles the growth of its democratic institutions. MJ Akbar, the Indian Minister for External Affairs, who addressed the Democracy Forum in 2015, is doubtful that Pakistan can survive as a deep state. Instead, he concludes that for six decades, power has seesawed between military dictatorship and civilian rule. And he warns that Pakistan is in danger of turning into a toxic jelly state, a quivering country that will neither collapse or stabilize. So let us hope and pray that something more resilient will emerge. The people of Pakistan dem demand nothing less. Thank you for listening to me. The concept of the deep state is that of a core decision-making body within government, but not necessarily answerable, answerable to a democratically elected civilian administration. It is by nature non-transparent, and its composition a subject of speculation. And though our panel this afternoon will be looking at it in relation to Pakistan, the concept is by no means unique to Pakistan. Much has been written about the so-called deep state in the United States and in Europe, not excluding Britain, sometimes characterized as the security state or the dual state. An influential publication by the American scholar Hans Morgenthau over 50 years ago, in 1955, discussed the concept in relation to the United States with the security state uh, in his, were able, in his words, to exert an effective veto over the decisions of the regular state governed by the rule of law. Recent events in Turkey have brought the idea into sharp focus. In Pakistan, the removal of the elected prime minister by a judgment of the Supreme Court has been described by supporters of Nawaz Sharif as a judicial coup against the democratic process. Others see it as a quite legitimate exercise of judicial oversight in combating corruption at whatever level. In earlier crises under President Khalid Musharraf, the Pakistan judiciary has been given credit for resisting an attempt by the then military government to neutralize it. So is the judiciary in Pakistan the protector or an enemy of democracy? That's one of the questions I expect to find some light shed on today. One theory is that the deep state comes into operation when a conflict arises between domestic policy and core foreign policy commitments. It perhaps cannot be seen as a simple conflict between civilian and military. In a recent article, an American scholar writes of a shifting caste of elite civilians who have all been at various times and in various ways aligned with or co-opted by the military. In one analogy, it represents the fine tuning of democratic institutions rather than outright control. But this is in a global context of concern, the a concern that traditional liberal ideas are losing self-confidence and that democratic processes seem to be turning against the very foundations of democracy. I hope that our panel will shed light on it. The first speaker, Dr. Farzana Sheikh, will be talking on the good Muslim and the politics of accountability in Pakistan. She is a specialist in Pakistan, well-known, well-regarded, a specialist in the regional politics of South Asia, a very uh, authoritative and sober voice uh, associated with Chatham House and many other think tanks and academic institutions. Her work has been published widely in, on, on Pakistan and in Pakistan and on South Asian Islam. And she's held university lectureships in the UK, the US and Europe. I'd like to extend my thanks to the Democracy Forum, its president, Lord Charles Bruce, and to Dawn Deegan for inviting me this afternoon to speak on current developments in Pakistan. It is a pleasure and a privilege for me to be part of this panel of distingu distinguished experts. We've all, of course, met before on numerous similar occasions, 
to reflect upon Pakistan and the threats posed to its fragile democratic culture. Today is no different, and I welcome this opportunity for a fresh exchange of views. But let me start by making some observations, which some of you may construe quite reasonably as taking issue with the title of today's program, Wither Democracy in Pakistan, the Role of the Deep State. It seems to me that when we declare something, whether it be a tangible object or a more nebulous entity, to have withered, it suggests that it was once robust and that it may even have bloomed. Now, I'm sure that many of you here will agree that this suggestion, when applied to democracy in Pakistan, is somewhat misplaced, if not out of tune with the country's political trajectory, which is much better known for its long engagement with military dictatorships. But we also know that this engagement has been repeatedly fractured by an electorate that is determined to impose its will in fashioning the conduct of government. Personally, I have always found the phrase bonsai democracy to be a more apt description of Pakistan's political reality than any reference to a withered democracy. Coined in the mid-1980s by one of Pakistan's most illustrious civil rights lawyers, Etzaz Essen, a bonsai democracy recalls a bonsai plant that is bereft of deep roots or wide branches and whose growth is restricted by its environment. That environment, in the minds of many at home and abroad, has come to be synonymous with Pakistan's so-called deep state. But this equation, implicit in the second half of today's, the, the title of today's program, seems to me could also be nuanced. For as it stands, the deep state can appear as something of a parody that projects Pakistan in the grip of a small, highly secretive group of individuals, almost certainly kitted out in uniforms with highly polished brass buttons, sitting at a table with the lights turned low and conspiring how best to thwart the next expression of a democratic consensus. Now, far be it for me as a long-time long student of the history and politics of Pakistan to deny that the country is immune to or invulnerable to manipulation by extra-constitutional forces. Whether we look at the 1950s, when a group of Rawalpindi-based senior army officers sought to oust the elected government of the then Prime Minister Liaquat Ali Khan, or more recently to the 1990s, when a clutch of military intelligence officers took control of a secret slush fund to determine the outcome of general elections, Pakistan is no stranger to conspiracies. And yet the emergence in the last decade of competing institutional forces in Pakistan that have sought to muscle in on space once thought to be exclusively the preserve of the so-called deep state has arguably made the business of conspiring against democracy far more challenging than at any time in the past. I would suggest, therefore, that we look at this question differently. For it seems to me that what continues to frustrate the course of democracy in Pakistan is not so much the deep state as a state of mind, still uncertain about how, to best, how best to reconcile the secular ideas of democracy with Pakistan's complex attachment to laws informed by Islam. The influence of what I am calling a state of mind extends well beyond what we commonly understand as the deep state in Pakistan. It pervades the country's key institutions, informs the outlook of its political parties across the political spectrum, has seeped into the media, and most importantly, has reshaped its constitution. Nowhere has its presence been more keenly felt in recent days 
than in the dismissal last month of Prime Minister Nawaz Sharif by the Supreme Court on grounds of violating the Constitution under Article 62 and 63 and failing to meet the standards laid down for a good Muslim to become a member of Parliament. Now these articles, which spell out the eligible cri eligibility criteria for a parliamentary candidate in Pakistan, such as a minimum age, holding national citizenship, uh, being free from a criminal record and or uh, mental health problems are of course common to most democratic constitutions. But Pakistan's constitution also includes what might be described as a set of morality clauses that require members of parliament to be not, quote, commonly known as one who violates Islamic injunctions and in keeping with those injunctions, to be both righteous and honest, or sadiq and amin. It is, however, worth noting that until Sharif's recent dismissal for failing to meet these standards, the Supreme Court had rather ruefully observed, as recently as 2014, that the Constitution itself was silent on the definition of these vague Islamic terms. Now, as we all know, Pakistan's appeal to so-called Islamic injunctions has long served its non-elected military leaders to mold the country's political institutions in line with their own preferences. Article 62 and 63 are no exception, having been introduced by a military dictatorship in 1985. <coughs> Nevertheless, it is important to bear in mind that the institution that secured Sharif's ouster on shockingly narrow grounds was not a military regime, but the judiciary. Applauded for introducing Pakistan to this heady climate of what we have now come to recognize as judicial activism, the judiciary has emerged in recent years as something of an independent force. Yet. Pakistan's judiciary also carries an unenviable record of endorsing military dictatorships in the past. Not surprisingly, it has led to worrying concerns that the judiciary could again become the instrument of choice for Pakistan's all-powerful military to stage so-called judicial coups against wayward governments at a time when outright military takeovers are being frowned on globally. So the question is this, are we about to see a replay of the judiciary's complicity with Pakistan's most powerful unelected institution, the military? The jury, I'm afraid, is still out, with opinion deeply divided over whether to regard Sharif's dismissal, by no means the first, nor likely to be the last, as a giant step for accountability or a step back for democracy. What can be said with some degree of certainty is that given Pakistan's long history of civilian governments being summarily dismissed, there are good grounds to believe that charges of accountability backed by vaguely worded vigilante clauses in the Constitution invoking Islamic injunctions will be used more frequently and indeed selectively by unelected state institutions to thwart the popular will. None of this bodes well for Pakistan, where the contested legacy of a state founded in the name of Islam is likely, I fear, to continue erupting into the public realm and threaten the country's fragile democratic culture. Thank you. Okay, let's go back to Pakistan, although, as I like to say, the United States and Pakistan have a, a lot in common. We have too many guns, too much religion, and too little education. So um, go to a madrasa, it's just like my hometown in Indiana. I have the same discussions. So Pakistan has a new prime minister, at least for now. Uh, Pakistan's parliament had a special election to replace Nawaz Sharif um, of the Pakistan Muslim League, as I'm sure you all know. Um, he was ousted in I, what I'm going to call, and I think many others are calling, uh, a judicial coup. 
Uh, Shahid um, Abbasi, who is a staunch Sharif loyalist, uh, he is the prime minister, and I sort of view him as basically a placeholder to keep the prime minister uh, palace warm, while the PMLN arranges to secure a seat in the parliament for Nawaz Sharif's brother, Shahbaz Sharif, in a upcoming by-election, which is, of course, a prerequisite to uh, hoisting him into the prime minister's seat. We've seen this before. Uh, Masharif <coughs> did it with... Uh, Shalka disease, and because of the way in which it was done, he is sometimes nicknamed shortcut disease. So this is this is nothing new. A lot of parties have done it, and it's probably how we're going to see uh, Shabazz become the prime minister. It's so, you know, in some ways, it's not surprising that Nawaz Sharif has finally been ousted. What I think is surprising is that he actually managed to hold on to power for so long. The army had its sights on him even before he was sworn in after winning an election with a really unpredicted margin. Uh, I was an election observer, and I was asked to do some um, write-ups on the pre-election polling. What the data had suggested is that we were going to see something like which we saw with the PPP, which is that there was going to be a, nece a, a prerequisite to have um, a coalition partner. And you know this is always, of course, desirable because the army can engage in shenanigans to manipulate um, coalitional friction, as we did see, by the way, uh, with the PPP government. When Nawaz Sharif came in with a, a complete mandate that didn't require coalitional partners, he understood this uh, as having carte blanche to basically follow through, or at least attempt to follow through, with some of the issues that, that he had wanted to pursue, and I'm going to get into those in a, in a few minutes. When his brother is expected to uh, take over, Shabazz Sharif, most people are expecting that we're going to see a little bit of um, a reduction in the friction between uh, Shabazz Sharif and the army. You know, he is a provincial player. He's not an international player. He has very cordial ties to the generals, and I think at least in part because of his uh, rootedness in the Punjab, he has a he's not had the sort of confrontational position that Nawaz Sharif has had, um, and of course he hasn't had the opportunity uh, to have the confrontational position that Nawaz Sharif has had. One of the things, and maybe this might be a little bit of light between my presentation and, and that of Farzana Sheikhs. By the way, if you haven't read her book, y'all are fools. You got to get this woman's book. Um, I think it's just one of the most. Oh no, no, dude. You know I don't, I don't, I don't do Chaplusi. And Jake, my former student in the back, um, I always tell people if you really want to get an idea of just how confused. Uh, Jinnah's various messages were to different audiences, you really have to read her book. You couldn't get away with that today, of course, because we have social media, but he was able to say different things to different people and sort of sell this very incohate notion of Pakistan so that in 46, by the time they cast their vote, people were actually voting for concepts that were really quite different. But. Um, really do check out her book. But one of the, perhaps, the, the sources of difference between her presentation and mine is that I don't view the Pakistani judiciary as an independent actor. Uh, I actually see, um, in the last several years, uh, a new condominium emerging in Pakistan, a new condominium of power broking, and, and that's actually between the army and the Supreme Court. And we've seen, uh, really going back uh, to the uh, reinstating of Chaudhary, this collusion between the Army Chief and the Supreme Court. So this might be an area of debate. Um, how much is the Supreme Court um, really on, uh, you know, the puppeteer string, or how much is it is it really acting independently? And I, I obviously don't view it as acting independently. I look at the the events really going back to 2008 or uh, 2009, when we have a return to democracy, as being increasingly alarming for the Pakistan, uh, for the Pakistan military. And the reason is that, you know, Pakistanis are increasingly hankering for democracy. And um, even though uh, democracy is messy and gross, the public opinion polls do suggest, uh, depending on the margin, the Pakistanis prefer a messy democracy to autocracy. Um, and there's a, a very practical reason, of course, why the army doesn't have the, the same power that it used to, and that is that um, President Zardari actually gave away the power of the president to simply dissolve 
the, um, the National Assembly and the Provincial Assemblies. And of course, that had been the tool that the Army had used from 1988 um, up until they ousted Nawaz Sharif in an outright military coup in 99 to pro-rogue governments. So the Army really has to develop new tools to keep uh, pruning the grass of, of democracy uh, from, from really taking root in Pakistan. So I've, I've argued that since 2008, the Army has really been worried about how it continues to keep democracy on a leash. And um, if we kind of go back, some of the, the tools that it, that it has used against Nawaz Sharif it actually began using against Zardari. So you may recall Dumb and Dumber, which um, is my shorthand for the fiasco that a former Lothario turned uh, politician, Imran Khan, as well as an activist cleric from Canada. You know, they essentially shut down the capital in effort to bring down Nawaz Sharif. Now, everyone knows uh, these kinds of mobilizations don't just take place. Uh, the reason for that is it, it actually takes money. Um, how do you get people to uh, leave their jobs um, or, or otherwise sit out day in, day out in essentially a, a, a containerized blockade of Islamabad? Um, and so they've been using these sorts of street theaters to uh, cripple first Zardari. And, and remember, it was a very similar thing with Zardari.